Guys, welcome to another awesome episode of Triggered. A lot to get into today because given all the news, I figured who better to interview today than former acting director of national intelligence, Rick Grinnell. So that's going to be ahead. He's at the UN. Uh, also, our former ambassador to Germany, he's the one that stood up to the insanity of what Germany wanted and you know, was a big actor in pushing back on NATO, making sure that we're not just the schmucks funding all of this stuff forever while they do nothing. So I think that'll be really important given that it's UN week and we're seeing some insanity out of there. Also, guys, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to this episode. This show is only getting bigger and it's only getting better. Uh, and now... Apparently, hackers are out to get me, too. Uh, as some of you may have seen, yesterday I was trending at the top of Twitter yet again, this time not due to something I actually said. But uh, my Twitter account got hacked, and it sparked quite the media reaction. Uh, it, honestly, it was uh, when I saw some of the stuff, I was like, you know, not that, and yet there was some of it, some of it totally inappropriate. I'm not allowed to condone it. And yet others that were like, you know, that's pretty good. So if you're the hacker, reach out, let me know. Uh, you know, I, I got back the account, so it's fine. But like, uh, you had some good content. So uh, some of it was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> the one about Logan Paul was particularly good. Uh, I think my brother wants me to be able to leave it, leave you in control of my social rather than me. I probably caused too many headaches for us. So uh, good work. And, uh, you know, I guess I got to go through the whole password thing and re redo all of that nonsense. But it wasn't all humorous and uh, terrible news. We got some good news. On Monday, I told you about Ukraine's psycho transgender spokesperson who literally threatened to kill so-called Russian propagandists. That means anyone who doesn't agree, I guess, with the propaganda being put out by Ukraine. I mean, it seems like a big deal. Our good friend, Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio, sent a letter to the Pentagon about America's funding of this lunatic, and it got results. Shockingly, it got results. Ukraine announced yesterday that they are suspending the spokesperson. You probably remember this one. It was the one that looked like, what well, you know, I say Zelensky in a wig, uh, threatening people, apparently with hit squads. It was pretty ridiculous. I thought I was being punked for a moment, but apparently it was real. Ukraine is desperate for Congress and the Senate to approve billions of dollars in new funding. So they decided to throw us a bone, I guess. We should learn from this. We control the checkbook when it comes to Ukraine. We should use that power accordingly. Everyone wants us to fund every little thing for them around the world, and we do. And yet they want us then to sit back and say, well, it's their decision, and it's their this when it's your money. We should secure all the concessions we can whenever we can. That should be leading from the front, not funding it and bending a knee to ever-changing whims of everyone else around the world, guys. That's basics, but our diplomats don't exactly understand that. Rick Rennell definitely understands that, so when we talk to him shortly, uh, I imagine we will get into that in great detail. And while Biden sends all of our resources to secure Ukraine's border, America's border remains completely open and lawless. Look at this recent video from the border. It's a massive group of hundreds of young men. No women or children. Remember, we're told it's a humanitarian crisis. Please, the women, the children, the this. These are fighting age men running across the border rampantly, right? If you're fleeing asylum in a country, you don't, you bring your wives, you bring your kids. If your motives are otherwise, you probably send fighting age men. At this point, I think it's impossible to even think that there's good motives to what's going on here. All of the people you see in the video are waiting to be processed and released by the Border Patrol. Illegal immigrants don't have to run across the border in the middle of the night to get into their country. That's only in the movies. There's no need to be s and rape. 
campus. Trump was right about that in 2015 when he announced. That wasn't a problem when he first said it. It was only a couple weeks after, and that's what people don't understand. That's why you realize this is by design. It wasn't a problem the day he said it, but a couple of weeks later when he started gaining in the polls, when he started dominating the Republican field and all of a sudden he became a threat, that's when it magically became racist. Some of these people could even be Chinese spies. There's been a 300% increase in Chinese nationals caught on the southern border. What the hell are they doing there? Adversaries are clearly taking advantage of our open border. Biden just doesn't care. As long as some of them are future Democrat Party voters, as long as they, whether illegal or legal, will be counted in a future census, it's all good. Come on in. It's about power. The Biden administration is not interested in forcing the law. Just look at Merrick Garland's performance on Capitol Hill yesterday. At one point, Congressman Matt Gates asked Garland if he's investigating whether Hunter Biden is selling access through his art. Remember Hunter selling paintings for like half a million dollars and some auctions he was actually outperforming Picasso? <laughs> Picasso, folks. Journeyman artist, never heard of before. All of a sudden, outperforming Picasso. You'd think that'd be a question that they asked. It's a good question. Imagine if I started selling paintings for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm sure a SWAT team, or maybe, since it's become commonplace, the FBI's hostage rescue team would be kicking down my door like they did my father's at Mar-a-Lago. Garland, though, has no interest whatsoever and said that he isn't investigating. Of course he's not. His job is to protect the Bidens. For all we know, he's probably in on it. There's 10% for a lot of big guys, in my opinion. Garland did so poorly that even CNN called him out. Obviously, it's very telegraphed to focus on Hunter Biden, the investigation and the indictment of Hunter Biden as well. What did we learn, though? Is there anything new that stood out to you? So Merrick Garland struggled with this. I think there is more questions than answers provided yesterday about the Hunter Biden prosecution. Okay, folks, it's no coincidence. CNN is going after Biden right now, right? Just, like, we don't believe in coincidence anymore. If you do, you're an idiot, okay, candidly. Just last week, a CNN poll found that my father is beating Joe Biden in a head-to-head -head matchup. The Democrats are panicking, okay? They can't lose power. They can't open the door for the investigations. They can't give that up because we'll find out so much more about what's actually going on in our country to the detriment of the American citizenry and our populace. And I have a feeling a lot of people have been making a lot of deals and making a lot of money that aren't supposed to. And we're going to get into all of this with Rick Rennell. But before they do that, guys, I want to thank our incredible sponsors. It takes guts to support programming like this. In all fairness, I say this every time, but it's still true today. You see the attacks on speech. You see the attacks on truth. You see the attacks day in and day out. If you're sponsoring a show like this, it takes guts. So make sure to go check out the folks over at Gold Co., right? Interest rates, they're skyrocketing. And of course, we're still seeing inflation, reckless spending, global turmoil, the Biden caused disasters every day, and it's only leading to more economic anxiety, right? For the average person, it's not just inflation. You topple inflation with with those rising interest rates because someone can't just afford to pay cash, they're saddled with that, that should be another component of inflation that no one's even talking about. I want you to be prepared. Owning tangible, physical, inflation hedging gold and silver can help secure and stabilize your portfolio. And GoldCo has top-notch customer service. They'll answer each and every one of your questions and they'll walk you through the whole process, okay? So to learn more and to educate yourself, go to donjuniorgold.com. Simple, D-O-N-J-R, gold.com. Learn, ask the questions, understand what you're doing, and take care of your family's financial well-being. And while you're at it, guys, don't forget to check out the incredible folks over at Patriot Mobile, America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. I say it, and I'm going to say it till I'm blue in the face. Support the companies who support you. Stop supporting those 
who hate your guts. And I have a feeling you're going to have a cell phone in your pocket anyway. So do it with Patriot Mobile, where you put America first with every call while getting the same nationwide coverage as the other major carriers. Patriot Mobile provides you dependable wireless service at an affordable price, putting your dollars back into action and supporting freedom-loving American values. They literally donate a portion of every dollar to support groups that fight for the First Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, our incredible Second Amendment, the sanctity of life, and protecting our brave police and first responders. They've won battles over school boards, uh, fighting the insanity that's trying to indoctrinate our children. They're doing that work. So you're going to have a cell phone. You can support those kinds of causes, or you can have your hard-earned dollars weaponized against you going to fund woke nonsense everywhere. So for free activation, it's quick, it's simple, it's easy. Go to patriotmobile.com slash triggered. That's patriotmobile.com slash triggered. And before we get to Grick, I definitely need you to like, to share, subscribe. I see how many people are watching, okay? Hit the like button. It's simple. That's how we push back. That's how algorithms work. That's how we get our message out there to make sure the most amount of people see what we're talking about, right? We don't have big tech helping us. We don't have the mainstream media functioning as our marketing department. We don't have the power of, you know, woke corporate defending us and the insanity like the Democrats do. We have guys like me and people like you watching. Make sure that other people can get it. So like, share, and subscribe. And with that now, joining me, my good friend, former acting director of national intelligence, former ambassador to Germany, all-around awesome guy, Rick Grinnell. Uh, I was an early adapter on Grinnell in like 2015, <laughs> mostly, mostly because the Twitter rivaled that of mine. Uh, it, it was it was hot, it was aggressive, uh, and and we saw you take that uh, to the UN. We saw you take that to an ambassadorship in Germany where you held NATO accountable, and we're like, you know, enough of the nonsense. Uh, but you're in New York for UN Week, obviously, uh, former. Uh, very high-level diplomat, ambassador to Germany, that's a big deal. Uh, we'll talk about that one in a little bit as well, because uh, your going-away party is when they outed Kim and I dating. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that was a fun one. But talk about what you're seeing you know, at the UN right now. What are the major takeaways and America's standing in the world under Joe Biden, because I'm watching, but you know, this is not my world, right? I, I talk shit online, I fight, I, you know, it's a little different. I'm not a diplomat and I don't pretend to be. What do you see right now? You know, Don, the, uh, the opposite of America first, if you wanna know the, the polar opposite of America first when it comes to diplomacy is consensus with the world. So there's 15 members of the Security Council and there are five permanent members of the Security Council, which means 10 of those uh, Security Council members get uh, elected and they rotate. Yep. The lowest common denominator of 15 countries is what the global policy is. When you when you think about what's globalism, what, what, what do we do to kind of make this third world UN you know, government? It's the lowest common denominator of what 15 countries believe. And at the UN, they believe every country is equal. And, and I don't believe every country is equal. I think every person is equal, but I don't believe that every country is equal. If every country was equal, then you wouldn't be asking the United States of America to pay a quarter of the bill at the UN. So I think what, what we're seeing right now, it's a long answer to say, uh, we're seeing this this idea of consensus, which is pushing the United States off the leadership role, not recognizing us as a superpower. And Joe Biden is really comfortable with that. Uh, he likes consensus. He likes certainly likes consensus with the Europeans. But what that means is that when you have these UN weeks, UK uh, head of state doesn't show up. France head of state doesn't show up. China, Russia, head of states, they don't show up. They don't, they, the permanent members of the Security Council literally snubbed Joe Biden. There's no mention of this in the legacy media. And yet we look like we're just another country, you know? Yeah. Just, talk, just, talk about that further, because that's a big deal, right? Like I, if, if the five, you know, or four other members of the permanent, you know, UN Security Council don't show up to hear the president of the United States speak, 
that's a big deal because I, you know, and I remember it was a really big deal when like Trump spoke at the UN and called out the globalists to their face. Uh, he called out Germany. I'm sure that created some headaches for you, but you believed in the policy, so it worked. And, you know, they were laughing about, you know, well, Russia's not going to ever own us because of energy, and we're going to go 100% green, and that's going to be total sense. And by the way, uh, NATO, we'd like you to uh, raise the spending to defend us from the enemy, Russia, that we're enriching by taking their natural gas and becoming fully dependent on them. And they laughed about it, and the media had a feel that, oh, it was so funny, so cute. And now... Trump was right, like everything else, Trump was right. Uh, but anyone with a brain would have seen that then and been able to call it out. But I guess it was just convenient to go after Trump. But what does this say, you know, beyond sort of the basics of clearly we're just losing our standing in the world, but what, what's the end game for America here? Look, I, I think it's really important to remember that whether we're talking about Washington, D.C., Berlin, Paris, Warsaw, uh, Bogota, it doesn't matter, but the capitals are controlled by elites, right? You look at Brussels, which is the capital of Europe, and all of the NGOs that are based in Brussels, the NGOs that are based in Washington, D.C., they're filled with elites. They, they, they don't want to hear from uh, the, the people who are paying the bills, the yeah. people who don't have power in those cities. They don't want to hear from them. They think they know everything. They think that they can control everything. So I believe that this is really a fight of elites versus the rest of us. And, and elites doesn't necessarily mean rich, doesn't ne necessarily mean uneducated, right? Uh, or, or highly educated. It, what it means is, is just people who want to control the system. The, uh, the Instead of having the power with the people, the power is with a few people. And so I think the answer to what's happening around the world is that the elites are allowed to control the system when people like Joe Biden are in charge because he's an elite and he wants, you know, just the few people in Washington, D.C. to make the decision. I'll give you an example of this consensus elite idea. Uh, we in the Trump administration felt very strongly, as you were in, inferring, that Chancellor Merkel, leading the Germans, uh, made terrible decisions on energy uh, energy policy. She put herself in a corner where they, they got rid of uh, nuclear energy, they got rid of, um, of coal, or started to get rid of, made a policy to get rid of it. And that was because the Green Party was coming on Merkel and she wanted to, to keep power. This elite system was like, well, I got to keep power, so I'm going to grab these uh, issues from the Green Party. She she took on the Green Party policies, got rid of this energy, put herself in a hole. Germany as a manufacturing country cannot just have wind and solar power. That's not enough for them. Yeah. So what she did is, oh, I got to have a second gas pipeline from Russia called Nord Stream 2. Remember, Nord Stream 1 is a, is a our U.S. policy was that Nord Stream 1 could be part of the diversification of Europe for their energy sources. But Nord Stream 2 went too far. It gave Russia too much influence, too much leverage. President Trump made it clear. He said, you're feeding the beast. Why are you allowing Russia to have this leverage over you? Chancellor Merkel's response was, oh, Donald, you don't understand. Um, we can control Russia. We're Germany. I'm Chancellor Merkel. We have a different relationship with Russia. They're never going to over leverage us. But we stood firm. President Trump said, no, nope, I'm going to sanction that Russian pipeline Nord Stream 2. I'm not going to allow that to be operational. We were very successful. We took a lot of heat from uh, the Germans. But what was missing all along is that the rest of, the, of Europe thought we were right. They were afraid to stand up to Germany, but they knew we were right. They did not want Germany having this pipeline. Merkel uh, gave up after, after Joe Biden took over, went straight to Joe Biden and the Democrats and said, please drop these sanctions. I need this Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Joe Biden calculated consensus with Merkel, consensus with the Europeans is a higher priority. So I'm going to give them what they want. So the Democrats and Joe Biden dropped the sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline early in this administration. That was such a signal to Vladimir Putin that Joe Biden would be weak. 
Joe Biden put Vladimir Putin's Russian pipeline back online and operational. He's the one who dropped the sanctions. I could argue all day that the Democrats caused the war in Ukraine when they dropped the sanctions on Nord Stream 2 pipeline. They welcomed this move from, from Putin. And if you go back, Don, and you look at the floor speeches from Democratic senators when they were arguing to drop the sanctions, it's frightening. They say things like, oh, we don't want to make Russia angry. We don't want to stick it in Russia's eye. Their calculation, their strategy was so wrong, the opposite happened. You encouraged Putin, once again, through the Obama-Biden era of grabbing Crimea, you encouraged Putin, come in and, and do something in Ukraine, start a war because Joe Biden is weak. Yeah, so, I mean, it, that one is crazy to me because when you look at everyone screaming about Russia, Russia, Russia now, you know, whether it's driving them into the arms of the Saudis, driving them into the arms of the Chinese, uh, you know, getting off the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, I mean, it, it was caused because of decisions like this. We empowered them. And so yeah. the irony, like, how come there's no one calling out all these people that were essentially, you know, pro-Russia energy, pro-Russia monetarily, give them this power. Uh, I mean, these are the pe same people on TV with a straight face saying, Putin's an evil dictator. How did he think this could happen? I mean, they they welcomed it with open arms. What did they think was going to happen? Listen, like I said, I'm no diplomat. I don't I don't pretend to be one. I don't even play one on I TV. I you're pretty good. You're a pretty good diplomat. <laughs> but, you know, I, it was obvious. It was, you know, like... My children would understand that you don't empower, you know, your enemies. And then when they do something, you act shocked on, on a world stage. But, you know, you don't hear mainstream media calling out the Democrats for that. You don't hear them saying Biden did this. You know, it's not a coincidence that Russia didn't invade any of their neighbors under Trump, but they did under Biden, they did under Bush, they did under Obama. Uh, it, why is that not a thing? And yet Trump was the one that was apparently weak on Russia, which is nonsense if you actually look at the policies, but it's no total, one seems to, no one it, seems to. It's total nonsense. We had the strongest sanctions on Putin and, and he understands strength. He yeah. also understands weakness and he saw weakness. I mean, the Democrats and the media will never be able to answer the question, why did Putin invade twice under a, a Biden president, vice president situation. Why did he do that twice? And yet he didn't do it under Donald Trump. Look, I, I believe that one of the reasons they kicked President Trump off Twitter was because he was being wildly effective in going around the filter of the media and going straight to the people, reaching the people, not the elites. But big tech and Fortune 500 companies, and you know this about me because we talk regularly, uh, I believe that Fortune 500 companies right now are so far gone left that Republicans should not be helping them. We should not be talking about tax cuts uh, and this UAW situation. I'm all for the workers. Uh, I'm not for big government because when big, I mean big, big uh, corporations, because when yeah. big corporations are allowed to do what they want to do. They give money to the Democrats. They have these terrible woke policies. The, the elites in charge get paid millions, tens of millions of dollars. Why are we helping them? Yeah. Why are we getting behind? Donald Trump, President Trump, has reorientated the Republican Party to the workers, yeah. not to the elites, which is why Mitt Romney does not like him. Because Mitt Romney, remember, is a total elite. Uh, George Bush, who I worked for, they love the elites. They have their their elite game. Yeah. And, and they don't want a party like a Reagan, like a Trump party that really concentrates on the workers. And so uh, I'll finish with this, is, is I think that the elites are being defeated. I think we've got to keep calling out the media for being a protector of the ruling party. Yeah. And this club, this club of elites in Washington, D.C., because the people are beginning to speak. The people have social media. Uh, we get, can get our message out. We are winning. It's just the elites are pretending like we're not.
Yeah, no, I mean, they're trying so hard. We saw that this week. I mean, Trump basically took the side of the auto workers. And yet, the union that represents, you know, when I say represents, it's like, you know, they represent themselves, just like the elites represent themselves. So, I mean, it, it's not just in government, it's in big corporations, it's in, big, you know, it's in everything. The United Auto Workers Union basically started taking shots at Trump. I'm like, so one of the biggest people in the world, with one of the largest platforms in the world, with one of the largest followings in the world, is taking your side? And you're like, well, I mean, no, we, we don't want that. We want to do it for Joe Biden. And it's because they know, too, that probably the vast majority of the auto workers are actually America first. They understand that the policies put forth by the Biden administration and EV, you know, electric vehicles and all that stuff is going to send their jobs abroad as Democrat policy and frankly, American policy uh, has done for the past few decades. America first is the opposite of that. And yet the people representing the stakeholders are, are spitting in the face of the guy that's actually got the best chance of representing those stakeholders, doing the most, has a consistent track record of doing so, and probably has the vast majority of those actual people, meaning the workers, not the union folks, the union workers who just pay their dues to watch it get spent to you know, bolster Democrat policy and a trans agenda somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense, and yet it's exactly what you're talking about. Look, the, the union bosses are the elites. There, yeah. there are a few people making decisions for massive amounts of people. And this is nothing new. When the leadership of an organization loses touch with the actual membership, that organization goes into turmoil. I mean, the, we, we are confident that if you did a vote of the union members, Donald Trump would come out as the leader. There's no question about it. Yeah. How did he win Michigan and, and Wisconsin in 16? It's like, because those people are MAGA. Those people are not voting for Joe Biden. They see Joe Biden like, frankly, the rest of the world sees Joe Biden as a bumbling dolt, uh, you know, and a corrupt one at that. Uh, you know, they're going to vote for Trump again this time. Uh, and yet, to again, have the leadership shun Trump. You're not welcome to come here to defend the people. Like, with arguably the largest platform in all of American politics, if not, you know, by far. Uh, it, it, it's so insane, but it speaks such volumes about exactly what you're talking about. And people, you know, the media carries it like, oh, the auto workers are snubbing Trump. No, no, no. Like two or three people in union leadership who are making seven figures, you know, exactly right. who, who are okay with them going on strike. And, you know, these people, if they lose their jobs, if they lose this, if their jobs get shipped abroad, you know, that's all well and good. It doesn't matter. Well, you know, we'll keep 10% of the jobs here in America. We'll get those people a little bit of a raise. The rest will go to Mexico and China and elsewhere. We'll open the doors for China's manufacturing of vehicles uh, to come into our country because you won't be able to afford to buy them. Uh, it, it, it's lunacy. I, I think next week we're going to see a big shift. I think that when President Trump goes to Detroit uh, and, and campaigns with the workers, that this is going to open up a rift between the workers and the union bosses. I think that's very clear that's coming. I hear constantly. I was born in Michigan. I'm originally from Michigan. And Michigan is all about auto manufacturers and those who supply auto parts. And and these individuals, many of them have voted for uh, Democrats traditionally, but they love President Trump. This is the new party. This is yeah. what well the role, the roles have Trump reversed, Trump. right? The roles have reversed, you know, I entirely. Yeah, and and this is why people like Mitt Romney, the elites, they don't like President Trump because they want to see him reflexively help. Uh, you know, the CEO of Ford, the CEO of GM, uh, he, they want corporations to, to actually win in this situation. And I think what we've seen with the woke policies and their, you know, elitist attitudes of working towards the Democrats, why? Why are Republicans helping these people get more money at the expense of the workers? I, I'm 100% convinced that we've got to be on the side of the workers, give them more money. They're, they're the ones that are doing the job. And, um, you know, the, the elites getting tens of millions of dollars, forget it. I'm not going to come down on that side. I, I, don't, I don't disagree. For those of you who don't know, Trump's actually going to Detroit. Uh, he's counter-programming the next, you know, vice presidential potential, maybe, you know, dog catcher <laughs> debate. 
Uh, and so he's going to be there at the same time with those auto workers. And so watching the union try to stop that, it, again, it's mind blowing. Again, to create a platform of power for the people they're supposedly representing, but then snubbing it at the same time uh, is crazy. Now, it, but it is one of those things, right? It's it's sort of like you know the black community in America. You're like, well, what has the Democrat Party done for them in the last 50 years? And the answer is really, you know, nothing. You know, yeah. virtually nothing. And yet. You know, you say, oh, well, they got to come to you this time. They got to they gotta be coming over because finally it has to make sense. I mean, a lot of that's similar with the unions, meaning, you know, Absolutely. even, you know, what, from the start of MAGA, it started doing this. What has Democrat policy really gotten them? All of these globalist policies pushed their American dream to China. Yeah. You know, there's someone over there living their dream, uh, you know, pulled out of poverty and stuff like that. That's great for China, terrible for America. Uh, terrible for those people. You compile that with a terrible education system because of the teachers' union, and you have a recurring theme where the unions seem to be representing themselves really well, meaning for the union leadership, at the expense of the people who are who they're supposed to be representing. And this is just another. This look. This is this is the world over right now in in Trump world. Whether it's Hispanics, Asians, uh, women. It, it's happening. Gays. I'll put gays in there, Don. Let, yeah. let, you put 10 homos in a room, and I'm telling you, five of them are voting for Trump. That is just the fact. I, the left is going to attack me for it. The gay left will go crazy with that. But it is true, because we've seen we, we, the, the leadership doesn't speak for us anymore. And I think we're seeing that with the unions as well. The leadership doesn't speak. They're out of touch with what the real life experiences are of the members of their community. Okay, so talk about that, you know, uh, uh, on the gay side of things a little bit, because you're right, the leadership there doesn't seem to, and we've had this conversation before, but it, the leadership there, when I, you know, leadership loosely, it's like, they're all about the trans agenda. Now you wanna talk about, you know, a warring factions, you know, people from, and, I, and I've seen this and they'll call me out for it as well, You've, you're a little bit more clear. <laughs> <laughs> on this one. <laughs> but it, like, it seems like the people who actually fought for real rights and stuff like that, who really were discriminated against, I don't think that many people really give a shit anymore, candidly. I think it's like, yeah. this is just one of those things. Like, you know, even even in conservative politics, yeah, obviously there's some people that do or the religious, right, the, on certain things, but I don't think it's nearly as much an issue as the left would want you to believe it is, e even remotely, as evidenced by like, you know, when Peter Thiel spoke at the RNC in 2016, he got a beggar standing ovation talking about those issues from like, hardcore Republicans at the Republican National Convention. Like, I was like, oh, so it's not even an issue, really. You yeah. know, the left continues to make it an issue, but there does seem to be perhaps the biggest warring faction would be between just the regular gays who want to live life and the trans community indoctrinating our children, wanting to mutilate minors and infants and toddlers. Uh, that's the leadership for the most part that I see in today's left. They're, they're fighting for insanity. Not, it's not about equality anymore. They're fighting for, they want equality plus, 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 Q, P, L, you know, whatever, you know, other acronyms they want to throw in there. It's, it's not about equality. It's not about being left alone to do their own thing. It's they about want power and money. Yeah. It's about power and money. Why, why though? Where's the money in that one for, well, you know, first where's of the all, money in pushing for a child to be mutilated? Well, it, it's, broad, it's broader than that. What it is, is that um, for, it's generational and it's about power and money. So first of all, you have Gay Inc., which is controlled by Democrat operatives. Mm -hmm. the, this is an arm of the Democratic Party. Gay Inc. is literally a wing of the Democratic Party. They recycle all of these people who are, are activists within the Democratic Party, happen to be gay, and then they put them in charge of one of these gay lefty groups. So they want this to be a partisan issue for the Democrats. So they look constantly for wedge issues. When we achieve equality, they look for another wedge issue. Uh, HRC has a huge building that they have to pay for in Washington with a huge budget of, of personnel. And, and they will constantly look for a wedge issue. They don't want to solve this issue. They don't want Republicans to be good because if the issue goes away, their jobs go away. Gay Inc. works really hard to keep the issue partisan. That is a generational thing. If you're an older gay person, you struggled to come out or you came out in your 20s. And so when you were coming out, you had to secretly go to these websites like The Advocate, 
uh, and you had to go and, and look at, you know, gay news because you weren't out. And so it's the secret thing. As the new generation comes forward and they're comfortable being out, uh, they're not partisan. They don't have the same experiences as the older gays to think, oh, it's a secret or it's a negative. All their friends know, their family knows, and it truly is not a, a, a big deal. And so they don't see this issue as the wedge issue that the older people do. So it's, it's totally going away. Young people can think about the border. They can think about global affairs and, and not wanting to have wars because Donald Trump is absolutely for equality and Republicans have moved. I, I, I've said this before and I really believe it. There's not a Republican elected in Washington, D.C. Uh, that could come out and be anti-gay and survive in their next election. There's not a single. Yeah. They would be I, I run think out that's hundred percent right. They would be run out of the party by Republicans, by Republicans. So okay, so how does you know? You know, I, I call it sort of glo the, the trans mafia, right? Yeah. They're, they're representing. Let's call it you know, 001 percent. Uh, 1% of probably the gay community, I don't know exactly what the numbers are. Someone's going to fact check me and we got to deal with it. But like, let's just say <laughs> it's the most powerful, minute, like minutia minority probably in the world today. I, you know, I, on this show, it's I have true. a thing. Like, if you're trans, like, you are beyond reproach. You could, you know, <laughs> to quote Donald Trump, you could walk down Fifth Avenue, murder someone in cold blood, and, and everyone would be fine with it. How did that happen, though? Because, I mean, I understand the power, and they're always looking for an issue, but even, even amongst the left, even amongst the gay community that I know, they see, you know, sure, a three-year-old, you know, you, I mean, you couldn't get a tattoo or smoke a cigarette for another 15 years, but, I, I mean, obviously you can chop off your dick, right? Why, why wouldn't you be able to do that? That's, I mean... Insanity. It's, Insanity e and even in the community, there can't be a lot of agreement on this. And I, I certainly don't see it. But again, I think mostly if, if I if my gay friends are conservative gays. But like but even still, how did they amass, you know, the trans mafia? How do they have much more power than, you know, what would have been even like, you know, the, the Hollywood or, the, a, a, you know, a strong, you know, gay representation cabal? Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there was disproportionate power there, but the trans thing overwhelms it all. And even, even to the detriment of ex and expense of people who are openly gay and coming out, yeah. like Martina Navratilova, when she came out, you know, as like a gay activist for 30 years, like way before it was cool, like, you know, 25 right. years before it was cool. Uh, and it was actually a, a, probably a serious liability at that time. You know, she says, hey, hey look, you know my, what? My hand is raised, too. It was a serious liability when I came out. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, and I, I, was... I believe that. But, you know, this is someone who is an advocate for so much of what the, that cause was. And she says, as one of the greatest female athletes in the history of sports, hey, like, I don't know. I don't think, you know, dudes should be playing women's sports. And, like, canceled. Like, 30 yeah. years of work. Like, fuck you. You're out. Like, it, it, it was look. lunacy to me. How did that happen? It's Gay Inc. It, it's Gay Inc. Who, who decided to have another wedge issue. Look, um, I think we as a society will really pay a price, and we already are, but we're going to pay a bigger price for allowing kids under the age of 18 to do this permanent to their body, uh, to have hormones uh, that, that block puberty. It's outrageous. And I literally see this as the majority of gay people don't think that that is right. The majority of my Democratic friends don't think that that's but right. But they're but they're silent. But no, they're still maybe, silent. Maybe, you know, maybe maybe, maybe to you they're not. But they're still. Why, why can't someone take that on from that side? Because honestly, I feel like it's a winning issue, and I know that because yeah. like if I'm on Twitter, okay, not Truth, where it's going to be more conservative, or whatever. But if I'm on Twitter and I'm like, hey man, like a 18 year old dude that became a girl three days ago wins the Connecticut State Track Championship, I'm like, that's bullshit. And the comments are not what I'm used to on Twitter. It's I hate Don Jr. with a passion. You are the big, you are the scum of the, and I can't believe I actually agree with you on something. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so if on Twitter, which is 90%, let's call it the other side, even still, you know what I mean? Uh, e this is even before sort of Twitter too, but it, it's still, you know, the user base is still going to be more heavily left. 
90% of those people are agreeing with me 100%, and that's already of a heavily left-skewed base. Like, this can't yep. be a winning issue in the long run, and yet they still have that power. Well, let's Gay Inc. has this power. They have the power. To, and, and look, this goes back to corporations are funding Gay Inc. You have all of these corporations tripping over themselves to give money to HRC or the Victory Fund or whatever it is, and, and because they've been, you know, there's been a shakedown. Uh, they 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 say, well, we'll we'll say that you're anti-gay. We'll score you low if you don't give this. So it's now morphed into this trans movement. Look, I, I'm proud of the log cabin Republicans, which are the gay gay Republican group, because they now have a message of under 18, over 18. And what they're they're trying to say is, is if you're under the age of 18, you need we need to aggressively protect kids, let kids be kids, no permanent decisions, no uh, hormone replacements. If you're over the age of 18, knock yourself out. But you still don't get to go into the, the men's bathroom if you're a biological female and you don't get to play in sports if you're a biological man, uh, biological male in the female sports. So we, we have this common sense approach to these issues, yeah. which I think is exactly what the majority of people want. Most people that I know, if you're over the age of 18, and as long as you're not trying to get into a woman's sports or, or a woman's bathroom, uh, they say, you know, go live your life. There's a whole bunch of things that people do that I don't agree with, but I have the attitude of like, yeah. if you're an adult, you get to choose your own way. Just don't, uh, yeah. you know, go after somebody else. Don't don't yeah. go into their bathroom and. I, I always say like, and I think the vast majority of you know the people I see, you know, I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to hear about it ad nauseum. You know, I don't want to be forced to do that, and I don't want to be forced to sort of comply to someone's like ever changing you know, whims. Well, today I'm a boy and you must address me. And if you don't address me as a boy, even though I was a woman five seconds ago, you're committing a hate crime. Uh, you know, but I mean, and you know, it sounds far fetched, but if you look at Europe, if you look at the UK, I mean, people are being put in jail for misgendering people. I, you know, that's, that's a serious thing. So again, if someone wants to like, hey, I, I've gotten in trouble for even saying, you know, hey, I don't even care. Do whatever you want when you're an adult. Again, as long as I don't pay for it, I don't have to hear about it ad nauseum. And I don't have to bend the knee to whatever the hell the ever-changing whims are. I'm just not going to do that. You do whatever the well, hell you want and leave me the hell alone. Yeah, look, I, I agree with you. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is this misgendering thing is so ridiculous. Um, if somebody misgenders somebody by mistake or for whatever, it's not the end of the world. I think if you're truly offended, which you shouldn't be, but if you're truly offended, you can say, you know what, I'm, I, I'd like to be called this or something. Yeah. And then it's a negotiation. You can't demand, you know, yeah. I, I'd like to be called 29. <laughs> well, but, right. I can't. I can't demand that people in social media stop calling me an asshole. Like right. they think I'm a huge asshole. I'm like I'm just a little asshole. Like there's much bigger <laughs> assholes out there than hey, you me. Got, but you gotta, but you I can't dictate those terms. Like that's sort of you know I don't know. Let's just call it a First Amendment issue. You know, and it's fine. I, you know, it, it, I don't. My life doesn't revolve around that. And yet, you know, there are people actively doing that. They'd love to be able to persecute those. You know. I, by the way, who even get it wrong unknowingly? I mean, you know, in all fairness, you see some of the, it's ma'am. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, dude. <laughs> like, relax. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't I mean, look, look like a ma'am to me. It's not the end of the world. That's the whole thing is, is that, but we've created the system that like, if you misgender, you're, you're a horrible, terrible person. And it's just like, you know what? Everyone's really busy and they've got a whole bunch of things to do. And life is a crisis. You've got family members with cancer and you've got to pay your bills and you know life is not perfect the idea that misgendering somebody is like a big deal i, I think it's uh, once again it's gay ink trying to have a wedge issue trying to create a problem so that they can garner more money more power within the political system and the democrats fan it they applaud it they want it because they get votes from it the more that they can define it as a black and white issue republicans bad democrats good then the sheep hear that and they just vote that way, which is yeah. why I got to, you know, give another shout out to Log Cabin. I think that group is so brave and uh, doing great work. And certainly our work in the Middle East, which is in Arabic right. and Farsi of trying to push decriminalization is is noble. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, they do do great work. And that, that was like one of the, the great ironies. I remember watching Secretary Blinken with all the Biden nonsense right after the Afghan withdrawal when he got up on a world stage and told him, you know, the world, he's shocked and dismayed that the Taliban government didn't install a more diverse and inclusive government. I was like, I mean, did, like, you know, these are supposed to be the serious people, right? The adults were back in charge. This is what we were told. And yet the people that we've been fighting for 20 years that were throwing homosexuals off buildings, dousing dirt, like they didn't have like a trans coalition. And he's, <laughs> he's, he's shocked. I mean, you know, if you're dismayed, fine. I forgive you for that. I mean, you know, you may, you know, we all want to believe in Santa Claus, but like, uh, you're, you're shocked. You're yeah. shocked that they didn't take your insane ideology and and just adapt it immediately and have this, you know, they're going to have Leah Thomas from the Penn swim team, very, you know, dominant, uh, <laughs> dominant feel, female swimmer, happened to be a female for about two weeks before winning all the NCAA awards and, you know, give her a big platform to bring up the Taliban trans coalition. It's it's yeah. mind boggling. Look, this is we're talking about the, the top diplomat, Anthony Blinken, who literally has been a disaster. And I, I would argue that Joe Biden knows that Blinken is a disaster. He's not allowing him to do anything. He's been pushed aside to do culinary diplomacy and the art and embassy program. And he's not you know, bringing a peace plan forward. We got the Chinese bringing a peace plan forward. We don't have anybody else. I also think it's pretty important that we mention that Zelensky, uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky, has asked Donald Trump for a peace plan, but he hasn't asked Joe Biden for a peace plan. Now, what does that say? I, well, I think it says a lot, but let, let, I mean, let's transition over, no pun intended, uh, to the Ukraine for a little bit and with America's involvement there. I mean, I, I may, this is maybe where the, these issues overlap. We saw, you know, last week, you know, they literally had a, a trans spokesperson that we're apparently funding threatening to kill Anyone yeah. who doesn't agree, just you know, spreading maybe Russian propaganda, you know, meaning they don't agree with the talking points coming out of Ukraine. They're being funded, apparently, by the United States of America. They're doing this on a world stage, dressed up as like a trans Zelensky. How can that be happening? If that was happening under Trump and we were paying <laughs> someone and they were representing the American taxpayer and they were threatening, you know, remember Russian bounties? I mean, yeah. this sounds like Ukrainian bounties. Uh, you'd think that'd be a story, but what, what's going on right now? You just dropped trans Zelensky. That's what? I mean, it was literally like Zelensky in a wig, right? You know, I was like, what the? I saw it, but but that's the point, it's Rick. Like, the adults are back in charge, and yet, like, a guy no, like me feels like I'm being punked. Like, I saw it, and I was like, this has to be like a Saturday Night Live skit from when it, it was funny, and it's not, like... But to you know, again, get in. In well, we need a trans person representing us there because if we have the trans representation, the whole world is just going to bend over and they're going to give us another trillion dollars in aid and they're going to go after the Russians and we can start a ground war in Europe because we have a trans spokesperson. Therefore, we are beyond reproach. It literally feels like that's the game they're trying to play to me, which is insane. Yeah, it uh, you know. We talked about this. The, the, the first time I saw it, I thought, this is not real. This is a SNL skit. This cannot be real. And I, it went days for people thinking, this is not real. Yeah. I tweeted about it because our friend J.D. Vance was was leading on this issue. Yep. And I tweeted something about it. Ukrainian officials reached out to me and said, hey, let, let me just tell you, this person was hired officially by the military that the president's office, President Zelensky, did not approve this. And and as of yesterday, President Zelensky put this person on suspension. And I thought, well, how, how is that happening? How is it that the president's office is not watching for two weeks the trans person from America, sounds like a robot, uh, really going after anybody who who doesn't you know support the line that the ukrainian government wants and yet it was happening i mean Zelensky was is you know all over social media and certainly all over america but then he comes to the un and he waves his finger at the world and says climate change is the most important yeah. problem so i i think when Zelensky <laughs> has climate change and the, the the English spokesperson is trans. 
I think it, it is an admission that the Democrats are giving him all the money. He's going to do their talking points. You know, he's going to talk about open borders here soon. Uh, and then uh, he, he can't complain that he has a problem with Republicans who think that this is just a big political operation. Well, I, I, I listen, I think you're 100 percent right. I, I guess that, that's probably where I was going with it. Like you had the trans representation check. You have the this. We're talking about climate change. I mean, you think I mean, you know, I've seen the pictures, I guess. I see the story. It's like you would think that he would have bigger things to worry about than climate change. I'm sure a war of this many missiles probably isn't awesome for the environment. And yet that became like a huge component of his U.N. address, not actually stopping the war, not anything like that. But yeah, I mean, so well, one thing we should point out one thing, though, about his address, um, he also put in there, uh, which I think was like a WMD type of moment where he was like, look, they're coming for Poland, Poland's next. And, and that was very calculating from Zelensky to to imply that a NATO ally is about to be attacked somehow he has proof or you know whatever his reasoning is that a nato ally is about to be attacked that's a serious moment and he yeah. made that claim at the un within hours within hours the polish president president duda stood up and literally made an analogy of zelensky and ukraine like a drowning victim just grabbing on and possibly pulling down the rescuers. That that was the analogy that he made. I think that when a NATO ally like Poland stands up and says, we're not going to supply uh, all of this, uh, we're, we have concerns about the way that they're acting, that's a warning sign. And Zelensky is in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, there needs to be an immediate check on that money. We've already seen corruption inside uh, you know, Ukraine. And let's be honest, that country was very corrupt before they started getting $112 billion from American taxpayers. Well, by, by many, you know, sort of, you know, people who do this, not like, you know, conservative reporting, but by many, Ukraine would have been ranked a more corrupt nation than Russia prior to this conflict. I think the other component that, we're, you know, no one talks about in this war was that, you know, I sort of feel like we gave Putin every excuse in the book by saying, hey, we're going to take this little buffer zone you know, let's call it you know, 500,000 miles of Ukraine, and we're just going to move NATO's border right up onto yours. Like, to me, you know, that these talking points are overlooked in this. Th I mean, so it's, you had a stalemate. is a buffer zone, a, a no man's land, let's call it, that was not part of NATO, that was, you know, ethnically very Russian in many respects. This was a buffer zone, and we're like, no, no, no we're just going to go right up on the Russian border. I mean, is that not sort of the, you know, act of aggression that, you know, whether it was an excuse, it would be a very viable one for Putin to use, or the act of aggression itself that actually started this conflict. Look, it's out of control right now. We're only talking about war and war options. That's the only thing we're talking about. And look, as a diplomat, Don, I know you've heard me say this, but I really am passionate about it, is that I believe that the president of the United States needs to have two options in front of them, a really good war plan from DOD and a really good diplomatic plan from the State Department. We don't have this one. We don't have a, a, a peace plan or an option. All we have is war and more money for war. There's no other option. I can't conclude anything other than Joe Biden has shoved Anthony Blinken off the stage. Yeah. He doesn't believe that he's a serious diplomat. There's no expectation that that our Secretary of State is going to push back and try for peace. And, and again, you know, I'll finish with this, is that it's so frustrating to see the media just clap and applaud the Democratic line. If you want to stop a war, you better have diplomats who are really tough, not these wimpy diplomats who do culinary diplomacy like Blinken keeps pushing but yeah. really serious diplomats. That is how you avoid war, tough diplomats at the table. Instead, the left keeps mocking the, the tough diplomats that Trump put in place. 
Yeah, well, you, you see that. You saw that with, you know, whether it's Yellen or otherwise, they're bowing to China. They, China shows up, they send a third-rate team of people, give them five minutes, and then they leave. I mean, they're insulting us across the board, but it feels like, you know, Blinken isn't actually, or never really was a diplomat. He was a guy that orchestrated the 52 intelligence officers to sign off that the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinformation. We know that now to all be bullshit. But, you know, that was the quid pro quo. We're going to we're gonna give you a big boy position for making that happen. Uh, and, and, that's, and this is the result. I mean, you, when you do that and you put someone in place that has no business being there, you, these are the results. But how... How does the conflict end? I mean, if Zelensky, I mean, you said this, and this is a really big deal. Uh, if Zelensky is asking Trump for a peace plan, but not asking Biden for one, what is it about? I mean, is, is the only way this war ends if 2024 Trump gets to the table? Because the problem is yeah. a Trump plan, whatever it is, in my mind, won't be effective if you have feckless leadership like Joe Biden in there. Meaning Putin, you know, like all bullies, uh, Putin, uh, the, he understands weakness and he will prey yeah. on it. That's the nature of predation. You know, predators, I don't care if you're a wolf, a lion, uh, you know, whatever it may, an insect, uh, a vulture, you know, that is the nature. You see weakness, you see the weak and dying, and you prey on them. That's what's going on right now. So he, the Trump deal, there's no doubt my father could actually get this done. But 100%. you can't do it without the power to actually get it done, without that office, because you look at what's behind it, you go, yeah, whatever it is, they're not going to actually stand by it. They're not going to actually do this. We'll get Joe Biden to roll. Or, which is probably the more plausible side of things, which is they probably have more information on Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and the dealing, since everyone else has it, that they would just roll that out. Or Joe knows that they have it, and so he's incapable of actually taking an aggressive position against these adversaries. Look, I, I think Zelensky is desperate right now. Um, he he needs to have some sort of a, an outside leader pushing a peace plan. Remember a while ago when the Chinese put forward a peace plan, Zelensky immediately made a comment that was positive about it. He said, wow, the Chinese have offered a peace plan envisioning territorial integrity for Ukraine. That's what he said. Quickly, the White House was like, Shut up. <laughs> you can't be talking about the Chinese peace plan. And they slapped him and he shut up about it. And now we've gone nowhere. Uh, I'll, I'll say this and it gets a little controversial, but that Chinese peace plan was a very good start. It was not perfect. It needs change, but it did talk about territorial integrity. Let's remember that the Minsk agreement, which was the agreement that Obama and Merkel tried to, although Obama blames Merkel, tried to do after the first grabbing of Crimea, there was also an inability to, to, to say territorial integrity for sure. There was this nebulous area of Crimea and you know autonomous or was it autonomous? There was all sorts of questions. They were not clear about it and, and it quickly fell apart because there, there was no clarity. And so we do have a basis for this, but I think the lesson is the Europeans by evidence of the Minsk uh, agreement. They can't negotiate this. I could talk all day about Kosovo, Serbia. When the Europeans come forward and try to put together a deal, it's analysis paralysis. There is no action on this. And so President Trump could absolutely ne negotiate a, a deal because both sides fear and respect him. And and that is, that is the truth. Yeah. Is the, but I think both sides don't like him. Both sides say, ah, like he's too powerful. But what he has behind him is a credible threat of military action, a credible threat of trade action, a credible threat of economic action. He would immediately institute. Look what he did with Erdogan when there was a uh, Pastor Brunson situation. Yeah. Uh, the reason we got Pastor Brunson back without paying any money is because President Trump said to President Erdogan, I'll ruin your economy. You don't give this guy back and we're going to have tariffs on tomorrow. Now, that is a credible statement coming from President Trump. Erdogan believed President Trump would do something. That was a cre the credibility of President Trump on these issues is great. I'll finish with this. I once was told by Chancellor Merkel uh, at, a, at a cocktail reception uh, when we were just chatting about uh, the uh, different situations, she said, you know, one of the problems with your president is that we just can't figure him out. We don't know what he's going to do next. 
That's the biggest advantage. And I remember sitting there thinking, don't smile too big. <laughs> Be <Yeah. polite. laughs> Excellent. But I ended up saying to her, I said, you know, Madam Chancellor, with all due respect, that's exactly where the United States wants to be, is we want to be in a position where you don't know what's next, and therefore, you can't predict us. So, you know, in the, you sort of mentioned, you know, not giving money for some of these things. This week, we saw a disastrous deal, right? Uh, and yet, the media touted it as this big victory. Biden recently made a deal to get back five American hostages from mm -hmm. Iran while giving back, I guess it was five, uh, to Iran uh, of their people. But it wasn't like five and five. It was five and five plus six billion dollars. Uh, you know, how, you know, they tout this as a win if they do it. Why did they need to give Iran and release six billion dollars because you're like oh wow it's a it, fine it's it's a win like trump was able to get back people for nothing not even in exchange for things because of that power because of that unknown that you're talking about joe biden makes a deal that people are like okay well fine it's equal it's like oh well here's the fine print equal plus six billion dollars to the world's leading state sponsor of terror that's yeah. insane to me it's insane. It's outrageous. And, and what's even more outrageous is that they're trying to claim that somehow, oh, this is, uh, you know, their money. And, uh, you know, we, yeah. we owe well, that, that was the deal. It's a good deal. It's like, no, 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 that's not a good deal. Like by, by no stretch of the imagination is it a good deal. But they try to sell that one to us. Yeah. And, and look, the, the money um, has been in this account. It wasn't going to Iran. It certainly wasn't going to Iran under the Trump administration. But the Biden administration changed accounts to be able to move it. And they're they're telling themselves that, oh, we're gonna watch how they spend it. Well, you, you know, you can watch how they spend that money, but you just freed up a whole bunch of more money yeah. in a different area. And and we're not stupid. I mean, you have these these Biden spokespeople trying to defend this and it's laughable. What what this deal has done is created instability uh, in Europe, made America less safe there will absolutely be more hostages with a higher price because of the ransom that the Biden team has just paid. Yeah, it's a learned behavior. It's like training a dog. Like you give them a treat, you're gonna continue that behavior, except in this case, you're training them that you can get billions from the US, you can get them to roll over on policy issues, you can get them to roll over this. I, I mean, I can't think of a, a thing that would encourage more kidnappings around the world than seemingly just Biden administration policy today. I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's really a dangerous, slippery slope. What's next? I have no idea what could be next, but I will tell you that this weakness coming from the Biden team is training people to test the United States. So I know you got to wrap up soon, but I wanted to understand, you know, just for you guys and for the people watching, you, you know, you're going to have a good take on both the power and the manipulation of America's intelligence agencies, as well as let, let's take that all the way into DOJ and what's going on with Jack Smith. I, I, what, as someone who's seen it, as someone who's seen it weaponized against us, you know, how severe is that power? How badly is it being used? Uh, and and what's the end game there? Because you know, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on that the American people at any other time in history would be outraged about, and yet it, they've become so normalized uh, yeah. to, to these extreme reactions uh, from whether it's the intelligence community, whether it's uh, the Department of Justice, weaponized against their own citizenry. Look, uh, we used to say 20 years ago uh, that intelligence was an estimate. We were very proud of that. It, yeah. Intelligence is just an estimate. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we're way off, sometimes we're right on. And, and we need to get back to the point where we keep telling the public that intelligence is an estimate. The entire reason that we have intelligence is to brief and prepare public policy officials so that our US policy is really good, that we know how to push US policy forward. It's been manipulated over time. Uh, you take raw intelligence, and, and you know, I could go into great detail of what that is in terms of how we collect it and what types of intelligence we have. But I want to focus for a second on the analysts and the analytical pieces, because a CIA analyst, an intelligence analyst, 
is somebody who writes a predictive analysis using intel using raw intelligence so it literally is an opinion writer they take intelligence and they say oh i see a b and c and you know what this is what i think it means and this is what i think is going to happen we have to be so careful about taking that analysis and not overemphasize it as the truth that is someone's opinion it's sometimes it's one person's opinion it might be a couple of people's opinion but it's usually just an opinion imagine if you would read the opinion pages of the new york times and there were no names on the opinion pieces you didn't know if it was you know an actress or a specialist yeah. right it was just literally an opinion there and you're like hmm who is this and what did they say well that's what we have from the intelligence community and we've seen them get it wildly wrong when i was acting dni i famously you know people didn't like it but i told the uh the israeli analysts that they had a real credibility problem they had just told the uh the us officials for years that if we moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the US embassy, that we would start World War III. And they were adamant about that. And that caused the US policy to slow down and to take a, a second look. And it, it really impacted in a negative way because people believed hook, line, and sinker that analysis. That analysis turned out to be not only wrong, but completely wrong, and the opposite was true. No, Once, Rick. No, Rick. The media told me there were like three people that threw rocks for about seven seconds. So it was a <laughs> it was a very big deal. Almost, almost World War Three. But when when we moved the embassy and we showed that we were willing to do big deals, that ushered in the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. We were able to produce peace between Arabs and Israelis because we moved the embassy. And I will go toe to toe with anybody to say those big moves are what makes people believe that you are willing to do big things. And so we have world peace because of that. And I said to the analysts, you have a credibility problem, which is uh, cru crucial to your job. No one's going to believe you anymore. Something's got to change. Maybe we got to change the team. And we started to change the team. But the reason why I said that is because I wanted them to know that there are consequences for bad analysis. And, and their negative consequences for U.S. Uh, public policy officials. I knew a ton of public policy, pu public policy officials who suddenly would question everything that the analysts were saying because they got it so wrong. So we got to fix this. We got to get rid of opinions. We need to do less of the uh, uh, forced opinions and more of the here's an estimate of what we think. And the media yeah. have to not take raw intelligence or little pieces of of, of an analyst's uh, talking points and somehow make sweeping judgments about facts on it. It is an estimate and people need to go back to that. Well, I think the media is maybe the worst culprit in all of that because they take the narrative that they want to see, right? You could have two conflicting opinions, you know, one with a total credibility crisis and one, you know, backed by thousands of people. And if the other one, the one that has no credibility, actually gets them where they would like to be, that is the gospel. That becomes the gospel regardless of anything. We saw that during Russia, Russia, Russia. We saw that during Trump impeachment one and two. You know, the truth didn't actually matter. As the saying goes, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Uh, and, you know, it's why they have the credibility crisis they themselves have. So you're right. I mean, I think we do have to get back. Uh, to, to fixing all of those problems, because why would we trust our government for anything? Right? Get that, whether that's now in the age of COVID and after vaccinations and what we were told about masks and listening to Fauci, who's been wrong about everything for 40 years and all of these things, uh, I think we have a severe credibility crisis across the board uh, in government. But they're fixable. They're fixable. I, I want to leave people with hope. They are fixable if you have people who can go in and make big ideas and not be seat warmers in some of these seats. Yeah. But to, to recognize a problem and to fix it, you, you, can, you can fix these. Well, that's a big deal, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, because God knows, watching what's going on, we need some hope. So, Rick Rennell, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, get back to trying to fix the UN and the disaster that's there, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon, man. Thanks again. All the best, Don. Thanks. Yeah.
Guys, thanks again. Make sure you're liking, sharing, and subscribing uh, to this kind of programming so we can keep getting the real message out there. I think it Ricks is a great message. Someone who actually did it in the field. It can be done. But most importantly, I love that there's a message of hope because I get it, folks. It feels, and very much so, that we're in trying times, but it can be fixed. There is a chance. It's not hopeless. They want you to think it's hopeless, so you roll over, you die, you don't show up. So again, guys, make sure that this gets out there by liking, by sharing, by subscribing. Download the Rumble app so you can see mine and other people who are willing to actually have these conversations message out there. Also, make sure to go check out our great sponsors. It takes guts to support programming like this. We want to encourage that, okay? We need more people to stand up, to be unafraid, and to support common sense. Check out the folks over at Gold Co. We see that interest rates are going through the roof. We see the inflation, the reckless spending, the global turmoil, the Biden caused disasters day in and day out. And it's only leading to more economic anxiety. I want you to be prepared. Owning tangible, physical, inflation hedging gold and silver can help stabilize and secure your portfolio and your family's retirement, your well-being. Gold Co., they'll take you through it step by step so you learn. You educate through your, yourself through the whole process. Go to DonJuniorGold.com. That's D-O-N-J-R Gold.com. Learn how to protect yourself. Take the time and just educate yourself. That's a big part of what we do. Educate yourself, see what's going on, and make the intelligent decision for yourselves. You can learn more by going to DonJuniorGold.com. And don't forget about the great folks at Patriot Mobile, America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. Guys, support the companies who support you, your beliefs. And honestly, guys, if you're going to have a cell phone, you can have it with Patriot Mobile or you can have it with someone who's giving your hard-earned dollars to fund the woke BS that you hate. Patriot Mobile is going to give you dependable wireless service at an affordable price while donating portions of their proceeds to freedom loving values, whether that's the First Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, the sanctity of life, protecting our brave police and first responders. It's easy, it's simple. For free activation, go to patriotmobile.com slash triggered. That's patriotmobile.com slash triggered. Again, you can support them and fight against lunatics trying to take over a school board, amongst other things, or you can give your money to the big guys who literally tried to cancel conservative programming on cable. The choice is simple. The choice is yours. Take the time, again, for free activation. It's quick and easy. Go to patriotmobile.com triggered.